we have debut on the show is James Hockaday, city manager, and um, we don't need to go into a whole lot of background because we have some videos online. Give me, give me a like uh, Reader's Digest. <laughs> Reader's Digest. Yes. Well, well, good morning and, <laughs> and thank you for having me. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with me, um, I, I grew up in the Columbus area, um, uh, just actually in Delaware County, Concord Township. Uh, I uh, went, obviously, uh, <clears throat> my entire childhood there. I attended uh, Muskingum College in Eastern Ohio for my undergraduate degree, and I was at Miami University for uh, my graduate work, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Um, and I spent about five and a half years in uh, Geneva on the Lake as their village administrator, and now I'm here in Conneaut. So how are things, this is a real specific question, how has things <laughs> been so far? That you must have been inundated with all kinds of stuff. Well, in, 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 anytime you move into a position, particularly, you know, in transition, I mean, things don't stop because administrations are changing, mm -hmm. so... Um, you're it's like you got a Ferris wheel or something. You got to jump on sure, while it's going. Sure, you, you got to jump on while it's moving. And uh, usually, there's some things that uh, you know need picked up from from prior administration and uh, continued. And uh, you're also trying to familiar familiarize yourself with uh, staff, administration, uh, process. Uh, you know, not everything is always identical. Uh, it certainly rhymes, but it's not identical. And plus, uh, half of the employees of the city have resigned since around <laughs> the time that you. <laughs> we, we we've <laughs> done a lot of staff replacement. Uh, uh, you know, obviously <clears throat> the the law director left uh, prior to my arrival right. here. Uh, Pat Beckwith actually announced her retirement. I think in October of last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, that was a joke. I'm not saying. Well, yeah, look yeah. at this guy. I'm yeah. glad. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and, and uh, you, you know. I, I should probably say thanks to Pat because it was wonderful. Um, she committed to stay on through a new city manager. I think it went much longer than she was hoping to stay, um, and I certainly do appreciate her staying and, and kind of being with me through that transition, and then uh, she even helped in the uh, search for her replacement, Antoinette Green. Um, and, and so Antoinette is, is, is learning that position as well. Um, Kyle Smith and, and Ali Heinenen, uh, uh, Kyle Smith being the law director and right. Ali Heinenen is the assistant law director. Um, now, the nice part is, is they're all Conneaut folks. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Antoinette Green, uh, Ali and Kyle are all, all Conneaut natives, so to speak. Um, so and Kyle's had the job before. He has, he has. So, it, it, but there's always a little relearning factor. Oh, I'm they, sure. Things have certainly changed in the last 20 years, uh, at least. Well, he started. Time. He was elected to the position. It was back during the days yes. of mayors and all that kind of yes, stuff. Yes, yes. So, um, you know, so so there's been a little bit of that. That's been a time-consuming process, certainly. Um, and then, obviously, we're in the process of uh, uh, searching for a new public works director. You know, so far, I... Excuse me just a second. Sure. Um, we will take phone calls, but let's, let us have a kind of introductory thing here. When we go to a break, when we come back, we will take some phone calls. Um, we've done a lot of interviews. Um, you know, I haven't been here quite uh, two months yet. Are there, uh, you got some good candidates? I, I think we do. I think we do. We had about 30 applicants for the position. Um, we did interviews <coughs> with, uh, uh, you know, I say top 10, but it was actually 11. Um, and then uh, we're hoping to narrow that down to a kind of a top three and start a second round of interviews. Uh, I'd rather be fairly thorough with an interview process. Um, you know, the, the adage is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, interview tough and the rest will be easy. Right. Um, and, and that's kind of the hope is that, um, you know, we, we interview aggressively and, and, and get a good candidate and make sure that we have the right person for the position. So, but all in all, between the three positions and, and replacement, I, I think we've spent between 50 and 60 hours in interviews of that, you know, mm -hmm. not 60, day, 60 days yet. So I'd say at least a full week, if not a little more, it's been just interview time. So, you know, trying to get everything else up to speed while we're doing all these replacement as well. So it's been a little challenging, but we're getting there and, and you know, there's a lot of kind of pent up demand for stuff that has been backlogged. So we're working through all that. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, thank Brian Bidwell, who's been 
Uh, he's our yeah. wastewater treatment plant supervisor. He's been playing double duty for us. At least it wasn't in the winter. Yeah, yeah, yes. And I think he's thankful for that, too. And, uh, <laughs> he, I think he is probably the most excited out of anyone to uh, see the public works director position filled so he can just right. focus on what he needs to do. So, But he's been great. Kind of like John Williams when you came into office. Absolutely. John was very happy to see me <laughs> when I got here. Bottle so. of champagne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, and... And John's wonderful. I mean, he does a wonderful job. But uh, certainly relieved to not have the all the day-to-day -day operation issues on his desk too. So. so amidst all of your interviewing people for various positions, you still get time to say we need a police levy. So what what well what can't brought you to that conclusion? Well, I you know I would say one, this isn't my first rodeo. Um, two, um, you know. You look at you look at operations, and and you can tell almost immediately if something is running, you know, optimally or suboptimally, and and, and even at an arm's length, you can tell on shift, 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 shift that these guys are running. Um, I mean, yeah. they're running literally from call to call to call. Uh, I, I know that the uh, press gets copies of all our, our call logs and so on. And yeah, so people forth. just behave themselves. I mean, I you know. We're at a little over 21,000 calls a year. Now, divide that by 365 and how many calls are we getting a day? Yeah. How many are they responding to? Now the question is, is how many officers do we have on the street on any one shift? And presently we have 15 officers, but let, let, let's sp split this out a little bit. We're down a couple dispatchers, full-time dispatchers, and we don't have any corrections officers anymore. So manning and staffing and maintaining the jail is now falling to a police officer. So, and so too are certain shifts on, on uh, dispatch. Yeah, so, so that's that kind of an expensive dispatcher. So, so you know, a full-time shift, um, you know, 24-7 is five full-time officers plus a little, little part-time. There's a little extra on, on uh, you know, to staff 24-7. So if you have 15 officers, that means you can have three on at a time, right? Well, if I just said you have to have someone in dispatch and you have to have someone in a jail, that leaves one officer to deal with all the call log. And so if there's trouble... Exactly. That means we're putting something else down to go help or assist that officer. Um, you know, and, and it certainly does not lend to any kind of proactive policing no. and enforcement. You know, I, I, I don't think there's been a council meeting yet, whether that be a work session or a regular session, a council say speeding's a problem. Well, that's great, but if that officer can ever turn off their, their pager long enough, you know, run from call to call to call to go turn on a radar unit somewhere, you know, it, it's just not really a practicality. Um, you know, there are some other issues, um, you know, when we start looking at overtime. I'm a little cautious around this because we don't always control our overtime. Uh, what people don't know is the police department doesn't always set its own schedule. Um, once something transmits from the arrest to the report and it goes into the court for prosecution, when that case and how that case proceeds through the courtroom sure. it is an important factor. So when they get called back to come and testify in court, you know, that's not always on our schedule. It's on so, the yeah, court he's schedule. So he's working second shift, it happens at 7 o'clock at night, but court's meeting at 10 o'clock in the he morning. Come, he comes it's got to come in. It has to come in for that shift. So that, that there's some elements that aren't within our control. There will always be some factor of overtime. Um, certainly, it gets more excessive. Uh, once we start adding in, you know, we, we go back to the you know, vacation, sick yeah. time, injuries. We've had some injured officers. You know, now we're trying to cover additional shifts. Uh, we've just thinned it out to such an extent. Um, that we're down from an all-time peak of... Uh, 21 police officers now and, and we're down to 15 we were down to 14 at one point I think council stretched to bring another officer on but it's all coming out of the general revenue fund uh, which is a dangerous thing to do and the reason why that's a dangerous thing to do is when we have economic downturns as we did that aren't necessarily always within Kanyat's control some of this is a global economy sure. you know uh, you know it, it does impact us it impacts our revenue uh, you look at several businesses, there were some businesses that dropped from almost 400 employees down to 50 or 60 full-time employees. Well, that impacts your general revenue fund. And if all your police officers are living in that general revenue fund, now we have an issue. We have to, you know, bleed off some of that, that policing because we have no choice. We can't print more money in the back like the federal government. You know, we have to run a balanced budget. We have to be sustainable. 
um, there are certain costs which are fixed costs, you know, our healthcare costs. Um, you know, we can we can tweak packages, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, you know, we know right, there's, an, so much, yeah. there's an inflationary <clears throat> rise on that. We know, you know, gasoline is going to, you know, increase in cost. I mean, thank God it went down the, this, this past year has stayed relatively stable, but we can reasonably presume in a five year period that the cost of goods and services is going to increase in those consumable goods for the police department. You know, radios aren't getting any cheaper. Computers aren't getting any cheaper. Software packages aren't getting any cheaper. Um, you know, police cars. Um, you know, e everything. You know, the pens, pencils, and paper clips of government aren't getting cheaper. Um, just as they aren't for anybody else out in the private sector. Just at your house. You know, uh, my electric bill hasn't gone down yet. <laughs> uh, when we have and electricity. Let, yeah, yeah, yeah. When we have it. When we have it. Um, <clears throat> but it, but at the end of the day, I think we need to. You know, bring this to the attention of, of, of the Conneaut residents. So while we're down from a peak of 21 officers down to 15, that's only half the formula. We're also, we also no longer have any corrections officers in the jail. Now that's an important point and, and the same is true with having adequate dispatching services. And it, it is an important part because of this, is because if we don't and we can't afford that and we prioritize having police officers, then that means when we lose those people, we're actually taking that police officer and we're putting them in the jail or we're putting them in the dispatch center. So you're taking someone that's at a much higher wage yeah. and putting them and replacing someone that works at a much lower wage. Uh, and the net effect is we're still losing the police officers on the street. Now, I think there are two things that I would add to the Star Beacon article that ran about it is this was an internal discussion uh, that I had with council at a work session. It was by no means a pitch to the public or right. anything like that. And, and my points were a couple. One, um, you know, obviously we have this operations issue. Everything that I've heard thus far is, you know, our police coverage is inadequate. Uh, two, what I've observed personally over the last 60 days is, you know, the police coverage is inadequate. Um, three, um, we're in a non-presidential, non-gubernatorial year. The library, the school district, the everything else, there's no other ballot issue on. We have a police chief that has already said over a year out, even prior to my arrival, that he is retiring uh, sometime at the end of this year, uh -huh. early next year. Um, I wouldn't anticipate a new police chief that would su succeed him to come in and say, well, let's go fight for a levy. Um, you know, that's not a, not a typical thing that you would see. Um, so, and, and we miss that opportunity of a non-gubernatorial year. It could be two or three years more before we have an opportunity to put something in the ballot. And, and it's really not a good practice to say, put a police levy up against the schools or put a police levy Absolutely, up. Absolutely. Yeah. One, we all work together, we wanna, we, but we also don't want to confuse the voters or mix the issues. We're not saying police is more important than the library or anything like that. Sure. Consider this issue on its own merit. Yeah. This is something also that was very that happened in Ashtabula. I mean, they had the same problems with mm -hmm. police officers doing the corrections officers' works and doing the dispatcher work. So they put a levy on the ballot. Yes, and and and, and, and it's a problem. I mean, and it's something that needs to be looked at. And and I think if <clears throat> residents are calling and saying we have issues with speeders, we have issues with response times, or whatever the case may be, you know, we we need more of this. Then then we need to have an earnest discussion with our residents and say, you know, do we need more of this? And, and, and this is me saying, look, you don't need one more police officer. The problem is, is you need five more police officers. You need an additional officer on each shift. And, and, and the way we've kind of, the way I outlined it to council was a couple more officers, hire a couple corrections officers, and add some dispatching time. And that will allow us to take those police officers out of those and put yeah. them back on the street at a much more cost-effective way than it is to just yeah. hire five police more, officers. More efficient, yeah. Yes, so that, that, that's kind of the, the way I would look at it. Um, you know, and that was my presentation to council and I said, look, your opportunity is coming up. If we would need to do that, then we would need to do that in relatively short order. As you know, we have to file uh, yeah. two ordinances uh, with, with the uh, county one certifying uh, revenues. So we'll pick a couple different millage rates 
and say, okay, show us, you know, what this would generate, what this would generate, yeah. what this, and that's a requisite for the next piece of legislation, which would be ballot language, if council would so choose to do that. So it's the auditor that comes up with the millage, is that? Correct? Yeah, well, they certify the revenue from a millage, right? Right. So I, I, I think the path that we're on based on the last work session is that um, we, we said, okay, give us a spectrum, and I, we said three, three and a half, and four. Our original presentation was three, but we're just checking the numbers. Um, our, our fear is if we said only three, and it isn't enough to do what we think we yeah. were, were looking at, then we need to make sure we have the right one. So we're going to ask for three different numbers. Um, it'll only be one uh, if it goes to the ballot. Um, that's yet to be seen, though. Um, we're still back on step one. so. You know, about language would be, you know, step two, and then it would be on the ballot. When does this all have to be certified? Um, essentially, by the end of July, we need. I thought it was coming up pretty quick. It, it is. It is, and that's why I brought it, it up. Like June session. 18th. Right yeah. There. So, you know, I, you know, you hate to come in and say, hey, let's put something on the ballot. You know, but this is also an opportunity, and I, I felt it would be, you know, bad practice for me to say, okay, let's watch the pitch go by because. You know, I've only been here for 60 days, and it's really about the needs of the community. So if we don't take this opportunity to put it on the ballot, it could be another two or three years. And it's ultimately the decision of the voters, so Absolutely. if they say... Right, yeah, I mean, all of this does, all any of this does is say, here voters, you know, you decide what level of police protection is adequate in your community. Now, that being said, is there's a level of responsibility that the voters have to understand is if we say no, then we're saying we're adequate with whatever policing level that we're offering now for probably the next four or five years. It could be 2019 before something like this comes up again. And everybody has to remember, okay, so it goes on a ballot in say 2019. Well, it's a whole another year before it collects. Right. So it could be 2020 before you see another police officer on the road. Um, assuming nothing else changes. Um, you know, it could be there's a secondary downturn in the economy and we actually have to scale back our force even more because uh, we're not indemnified, uh, you know, against that because it's all in our general revenue fund, which is largely income tax driven. Or Apple builds a big factory here. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it could go the other way, but, you know, I mean, which, which way do you take? Do you take the conservative approach or you say yeah, every, every, everything's going to be hunky-dory? I, I, I tend towards the more conservative approach. Okay, um, I said we were going to go to a break before we got our first call, but we'll, we'll take the first call and we'll go for a break. Good morning, you're on the air. This is Mr. Sharp, Sharpie. How are you doing, Sharpie? How oh, is your... Good, good. Hey, I saw your, uh, the, that uh, lot beside your house the other day. Yeah, they finally mowed that yard uh, behind me. Took them five weeks, but they finally <laughs> mowed it. 16th and Mill Street. But my streets are not clean, they're all full of dirt and mud. And someone lives on Broad Street and said that their front yard is not, not clean. You know, dirt, leaves, sticks, and so forth on Broad Street and also on 16th Street. Okay. I used to clean them and sweep them, and, and I can't do it no more. But it sure is a mess. Okay. All right. They uh, finally mowed the grass. And they left a big... Uh, Glass, grass on the sidewalks, and I can't move that either. Uh, yeah, that was pretty long there, I noticed. Okay, okay thank you. All right, thanks, Sharpie. Thanks. Okay. Okay, okay. Well, I, I touched on a couple of those things. Um, one, the, the grass mowing hat was not bid prior to my arrival. Uh, it probably, you know, we, we could have been a little tighter. So we did go out for quotes after I got here, um, and uh, they started doing some mowing. Uh, last week and, and they're in their second week of code enforcement mowing um you know i can follow up on the you know clumps of grass or whatever um and then the street sweeper issue this is one that's already come up numerous times <laughs> since i've been here and there's a couple of things that are that, that are that are my understanding at this point is while the street sweeper is relatively new it actually doesn't have a brush a main boom brush it's got a curb brush on it so it cleans the curb line uh, but it essentially uses air jets to push the debris back to the suction piece. So if there's matted down leaves or stuff like that in the roadway, it's actually not picking that up very well. Um, you know, this is something that came to my attention last week. 
Um, so I'm going to see if we have maybe a, a, a boom brush that goes on the front of you know a construction debris brush that can pull some of that up, and then we would actually it'd be a little more intensive process. But um, and then there's a bunch of catch basins that need to be clean. I mean, I just I feel like everything right now we're we're a little bit on our, our heels because we got a, a late start. Yeah. Um, you know, essentially not till April or May. You know, um, into moving into some of this stuff. So. I'd hope future years were a little more forward leaning, you know, but I'll be here sooner, so I'll okay. be here. So. Can you talk a little bit about um, old buildings like the bunkhouse? What's sure. wrong with that? Uh, the Kmart building is that just wasting away to Margaritaville, or what's going on? With, with <laughs> well, in, 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 you know, and this is not, <laughs> I, I would say, it's not unusual, um, you know, certainly for. You know what I would consider kind of a post-industrial town in northeastern Ohio. I mean, I think if you look at any of the towns around us, Youngstown, Geneva, Erie, you know, any any of these areas around us, all all we all have the same problem. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have these vacant structures, um, and, and what do we do with them? And, and it really depends on each as a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, so we we handle them differently. Now, the, the Kmart structure was previously owned, it's now been foreclosed upon, it's under new ownership, which is at the bank. Um, so are they trying to sell it now? Yeah, well, they will try and sell it or face a code enforcement action themselves, um, you know, which they're required to remediate it, um, whether that be a bad roof or, you know, they got some graffiti on the front of it, they do need to Yeah, it's, it I mean, it's getting... As an, as an entry point. And, and, there, there needs to be a proportional, you know, I would rather, much rather see them uh, clean it up, find a good tenant, and, and repopulate the building. And I'm sure that's their desire as well. I mean, obviously, they have, you know, essentially a toxic asset on their hands right now where, uh, you know, it's, it's defaulted. Mm -hmm. You know, they lent the money, they lost some money in, in that loan, um, and now it's come back to them. Um, so what they do with it is, uh, you know, now is... How can we create potentially a win-win? Can we help them if they're willing to invest in this structure? Can we help them find a suitable tenant? Um, and I, you know, that would kind of be the approach. If we look at the bunkhouse, the bunkhouse is a completely different yeah. thing altogether, uh, in the sense that it's got such massive structural issues. Uh, where we're at with it right now is we are trying to um, uh, talk with a neighboring property owner. I uh, have a structural engineer uh, that is preparing a. Uh, a list of alternatives uh, because obviously whatever we choose to do with the bunkhouse is going to impact the neighboring property because it's structurally reliant on the bunkhouse. Right. Uh, I'm no engineer, I'll be the first to tell you this, um, uh, and if we need to take a call, yeah, we can take a call. Uh, good morning, you're on the air. Hi. Hello. Um, prior to, uh, hi Mr. Hockaday, uh, <laughs> good morning. I'm glad that you came to our town. Um, prior to your arrival uh, for about three years, we have been having a uh, odor that comes to our town, usually in the evening or weekends that last overnight. Uh -huh. uh, on the net, uh, there were uh, over 1,200, uh, probably 1,500 people who have signed a petition and uh, the odor seems to be originating from the southwest uh, Amboy area. Uh, we have no permits for dumping uh, injection well fluid or uh, waste of this type. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, uh, obviously, someone is dumping this uh, waste. And um, we're this has caused, there's a cluster area where ALS is high, we have high cancer, uh, we have high MS, and I was wondering if you would look into this to try to find out um, who is dumping this, and also, uh, are we still dumping um, this waste on the southern roads? Well, there, there, there are two, two different items there. One, um, if somebody is dumping um, uh, 
brine or, 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 or waste, injection well waste, and there's a couple different classes of that stuff, um, then I would, I would hope we could see someone call in and report a, a truck, a location, specific location, um, you know, this is a big town, you know, and, and I always tell people, I, I, I'm happy when people call in and say, hey, we see this, we see this, because we can't be on all 26 square miles right. of road and everything else all the time. So, you know, we do rely on, on residents and citizens to call us and say, hey, this doesn't look right. Could you look into it? So, mm -hmm. you know, on, on, on that order, if, if there are people in that area that are noticing the odor uh, at a specific time, um, if they're, you know, seeing a vehicle or something of that nature, uh, you know, call and report it to the police. I mean, they're there 24-7. They will get the report to me, um, you know, of, of something along those lines, and I would be happy to look into that. Um, okay, or get the license plate number of oh, the that, uh, that's vehicle. Even, um, even better. Yeah. <laughs> even better. Um, it, it, and then I'll, I'll jump over to your second point. And there are two different types of, of, of brine out there. Um, mm -hmm. One would be the stuff that comes directly out of the well that was direct spread. Um, now, that is what they did last year. Presently, we're having a slide-in unit so we can do our own dust control because the issue was you know hey if somebody calls we got a lot of dust down here can you come deal with it you know it might be a week or two before we get down there and it's kind of out of our control when you contract that um, and, and, and I didn't like that idea necessarily too much because it was raw brine uh, what what they're suggesting and, and kind of what they're on pace to do is what's called a manufactured brine so it's actually a treated brine it's it's gone through something similar to a wastewater treatment plant um, and, and for the most part um, anything that would be hazardous or whatever it has an MSDS sheet um, you know just like any any kind of substance that we would use of, of what is actually in it uh, for the most part it's salt and it has a high salinity level um, and, and that is what binds together and crystallizes to uh, allow you to have a longer period without needing to wet the road um, mm -hmm. because it actually you know encapsulates the dust and crystallizes a little bit and wash your car yeah well <laughs> yeah and, and you know I mean it's uh, it's you know we pick our poison here do, yeah. we, do, do we want you know dust and, and constant dusty roads I mean they used to use uh, MC 70 which was an oil-based petroleum product which obviously had the potential to run off um, you know, so I mean, it's it's kind of you know we have to choose what we are okay living with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we want dust, then we can go with dust. If we would rather not have dust, then you know there's a limited series of options that we have to choose from. Uh, the the MC70 is pretty pretty outdated and, and not very acceptable on roads anymore. So uh, the and then they were doing brine, and now they've stepped back to you know a manufactured brine. Caller, do you have a specific area you think that they're dumping this stuff, or the injection wells? I, uh, pardon me. Do you have a specific area you think that they're in, they're um, dumping this stuff? I, I can't hear you on the phone. Oh. oh. Well, that's not good. Yeah. Um. Do you know any specific areas that they are um, might be dumping this stuff? Wait a second. Okay. Why don't we? Yes. Um, I don't know precisely. I know it's in the Amboy. I was talking with my husband. Um, I know it's in the Amboy area. Other people have reported that. Uh, Gore Road, possibly. Um, I don't know the exact location, um, but I do know that the odor comes down Lake, in Lake Road area. It comes down in Township Park. I know the, awesome. the smell, it's very toxic, um, and uh, it needs to be addressed. We're not going to have tourists if we have these odors settling in, and uh, I think it's killing the trees. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not healthy. It's just not healthy. Okay. And uh, we have uh, a lot of people with illnesses. Uh, we need to address it. We don't want to have, yeah. um, you know, more things here than an industry would bring. Right. 
Yeah. Well, and, and okay, it, thank you. And that will, you know, uh, again, if somebody sees something that looks like suspicious dumping or something like that, please just call and report it. Um, you know, uh, we're seeing Gore Road these days. That's a lot more traveled because of the Amboy Bridge. Sure, sure. So it seems to be more difficult these yeah. days to. Yeah. You dumping stuff out there. But. Well, there, there could be other things going on. Um, you know, one of the things that I would tell people is, you know, obviously they're over there working on the 20 bridge. Uh, one yeah. of the things that has kind of a really pungent odor to it is a, a uh, you know, uh, a welder, like MIG yeah. welders. And, you know, burning metal has a very unique odor to it. Um, but what know. if it goes to Township Park? Uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, again, a specific report you know, call the police, say we have a notice of uh, dumping. Uh, we had somebody dumping on uh, the east side of town the other day, and, and we went out, the police uh, investigated it, our code enforcement officer investigated it. Um, you know, so we do respond to those things. Well, uh, we, it, it's forthcoming, so I yeah, it, but, yeah. but at the end of the day, you know, if we have a specific report, we have something we can respond to. Um, you know, it, even if I'm smelling the odor and it's very strong, you know, call and report it so we can log a time of day. Right. Um, you know, frequently I have people, you know. Uh, talk, who should they, should they call the police or the yeah, city manager's call, office? Yeah, call, call the police. Call the dispatch number um, and, and just report it so it gets logged. Um, they're also welcome during, you know, daytime hours to, to call me. Um, you know, obviously our office isn't staffed at night. So right. if it's at night, we have no way to go investigate it. So right. we would have to wait until the next day, and it might be gone by that point. So, you know, my just call and dispatch. Say, hey, we're smelling very strong odors. We think there's a problem. You know, could could we have someone check it out? And and most likely, the dispatch would contact me or my office or, you know, um, Mr. Bidwell or or, mm. or or someone that we can go out and take a look and see what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about the street resurfacing program? We sure. Have Four hundred seventy thousand sure. dollars worth of. Street resurfacing? It's authorized to go to that amount. Right. Uh, the base bid was um, more along the lines of $425,000. So I'm hoping to either weave in some additional quantities or some of the alternates uh, that were proposed in the, the, the bid packet. So where, we're, where we are right now, and I knew I should have grabbed a copy of the bid specs because everybody's going to ask me which roads. <laughs> and off the top of my head, I don't have them memorized as of yet. I'll get there. Um, but um, it, it, is, it is a blend of treatments across several roads. Um, and, and essentially, this is how I approach it. I mean, um, I, I don't have the exact figure off the tip of my tongue here either, but you know, we have several hundred lane miles of, of paved streets within the city. And what's a lane mile? A lane mile is an individual uh, you know, uh, lane. Of, okay. of street, so you know, a full street would be we two do. or four or six, you know. But typically, when you count, you count lane miles. Um, you know, most of the streets in town are two lane streets, right. and, but there are a couple fours. Um, <clears throat> but w when we look at that, and, and and I'm so glad Tanya has a dedicated levy for street maintenance and repair because this is going to be a growing issue everywhere. It was an issue in the last community I was in, and all the neighboring communities around us. We all have same issues as, you know, asphalt. We all have winter. <laughs> we all have winter. We've all had a couple rough winters yes. here, um, and asphalt costs a lot of money. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you look at it, if you're doing, you know, a full depth restoration, then that means once the base and the sub base are, are bad, and you literally have to take it down, build it back up with gravel, a scratch course, a wearing course, um, you know, you're looking somewhere in the area of, you know, maybe 20 to $30 a square foot. I mean, that's really, really high yeah. uh, in cost. Now, what we're looking at um, is, you know, once that wearing course has begun to deteriorate, it's not too far into the base or it's limited spots along the street, we do what it's called a, a mill and fill. They bring in a pavement planer, they plane off, you know, a certain depth of asphalt, and then they bring it back up uh, with a new wearing course. Um, and, and that is a large portion of what we're doing. The lion's share of the dollars are going to that. My point of emphasis moving forward is, is when we talk about asphalt, we need to make sure that we're talking about it appropriately. I would say we need to emphasize some best practices, emphasis on crack sealing and maintenance and keeping good roads good. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the mantra ODOT uses is worse versus worse. 
and, and by that you blow a lot of budget on a very limited area and you know you get another 14 years out of it but if we spend money on an aggressive maintenance program so if you look at what we're doing this year as opposed to what they did in 2014 is we've blended in some uh, blended in some some additional chip seal uh, chip seal fog uh, we'll make that uh, distinction there is they come in they put in a base of emulsion um, and then they put in um, you know an aggregate in this case it's a pre-coated slag uh, number eight slag and then they follow that up with a secondary uh, fog emulsion um, and that seals all the fine cracks uh, if your asphalt is starting to get what's called bony uh, a lot of limestone mm -hmm. is, is showing and you see this in, in like a parking lot you, you know it should be black it's asphalt it's been plowed down it's been a bunch of years it's sun bleached you know uh, mm -hmm. that's bony asphalt and that does a couple of things one limestone is porous so the water gets into it a little more and obviously freeze thaw is not very kind to it but also once that kind of top layer of emulsion is it dries out the the, the main emulsion that binds uh, the aggregate together and it becomes inflexible and then when the ground moves expansion contraction from heat and temperature changes sunlight etc now it starts to get a little flaky um, if we do a chip seal or something like that, it makes it black again, which has a higher reflection rate, absorption rate for sunlight, so it'll melt snow more quickly, but yeah. it also protects that base asphalt from drying out and becoming more inflexible and cracking and falling apart, kind of the alligatoring that you see. Um, so there, there's, a, there, there's kind of a wide variety of things that we can do with the asphalt. Uh, my emphasis and my emphasis moving forward would be more towards you know preservation let's try and keep the good roads good yeah. and then we'll address the major issues where they're kind of rip out and replaces and and, and there's no shortage of things to do with. what about the beautiful route 20 there on the west side oh, where every, yes. every few weeks i forget i'm going down that road and i think oh, i've got a flat tire but no it's just <laughs> well um in the the one interior or i guess it's the outside lane on the going headed westbound, yes. so it'd be on the, the north side there. Um, that is a composite road, and it ha originally had a concrete substrate in it. And what, what's happened is, is that concrete has now, um, you know, just like a sidewalk in the cut lines, it's starting to move and, and, and do a little bit of this. So it, it has a reflective action on the asphalt on top of it. So now the asphalt is, is doing that. It may not break apart. And then your car is doing that. <laughs> and then your car is doing that. And obviously it's worse in winter than it is in summer because, you know, it's, it's, it's thawed, it's laid back down a little bit. Um, we had some preliminary discussions with uh, ODOT uh, in terms of what we could do because there's a little bit of an opportunity in it and that we can talk to uh, see see if we can get something done while the bridge is closed and it's not a high traffic route right now. Yeah. Um, and, and there was some initial movement. Uh, the district chief then retired, uh, Tony Urankar. I'm probably mispronouncing his name horribly, uh, but he retired. Um, I don't know that we have a new chief in there yet, but uh, we were talking something along the lines of them furnishing materials and, and we would try and uh, okay. do the repairs. But essentially, the, the solution to the problem isn't to resurface, it's to go all the way down to the sub base, rip that concrete composite road out, or you actually segment a concrete crusher comes in that's got like a steel blade and it would crush that concrete. You'd mm -hmm. realize it as base. Okay. I think we're about out of time. Okay. All, <laughs> all right. right. Well, I, I would just tell you thank you very much. All right. For well, thanks for stopping here. in, Jim so, Hockaday. And I'm, I would be happy to come back. Okay. We will invite you back.